Hello, my name is Natella Rachmanina, and I am inviting you and welcoming you to the session 15, 19, uh, 918 at the National Ryan White Conference of 2020 at the virtual conference. We're inviting you to the session that is entitled Innovations to Increase Engagement with HIV Services Among Adolescents and Young Adults Living with HIV. And the session will be conducted jointly by myself with two of my colleagues from Children's National Medical Center, Children's Hospital in Washington, DC, United States. Two of my colleagues joining me will be Nara Lee, licensed social worker and Ali Ben Munger, our registered dietitian. Today, we would like to talk to you about several of innovations we have tried in our program to increase engagement of young people with HIV services and to increase their retention in care. To start with, I'd like to uh, show you our disclosures, share with you our disclosures. Uh, we are grantees of Ryan White Awards at Children's National Hospital, and I'm also listed some active membership at the national, international, and regional bodies I serve on. This presentation will not discuss unapproved use of any drug or devices and the continuing education activities managed and accredited by Affinity C in cooperation with HRSA and LRG. There is no commercial support for this activity. The learning outcomes from the sessions are three. The first, we would like to review and identify with you the barriers to engagement and care of adolescents and young adults living with HIV. And from now on, you will see on the slides the abbreviation AYALHIV in the United States. Second, we would like to uh, utilize you to feel comfortable utilizing innovative approaches to effectively support transition along the continuum of care among adolescents and youth living with HIV, and then apply creative interventions to engage adolescents and young adults in their support networks and communities in your work. Let me start by broader introduction of why you specific targets and why they are so important in our work and quality management of our HIV program. When you look at the HIV cascade among adolescents and young people in the United States who are aged 13 to 24 years, and when we look at the cascade from the moment that they receive their diagnosis, which is only 56% for 2016 uh, statistics listed by CDC in 2017, you can see that gradually the numbers in this figure keep coming down and decrease to 27% of those who are virally suppressed in the era when we have such efficient treatment that can completely uh, suppress your viral load. And these numbers have been just updated on the HRSA website just a few weeks ago after we submitted our slides. However, the numbers of viral suppression for young people remained low, and they remain significantly lower than any other, any other age cohort in the United States. When we look regionally in the Washington DC area where we work with our program and look at the viral suppression within six months of diagnosis among all new cases in District of Columbia during a significant period between 2014 and 2018 represented on the slides. Here you see the data from approximately 2000 individuals and where I'd like to bring your attention is in the bars in the middle of the graph, a little bit darker green, you can see that the ages between 0 to 19, 20 to 25, and if we look a little bit to older, younger adults, but older youth under age of 30, 25 to 29, it's quite suboptimal, it ranges between 50 to 52%. So slightly higher than national range that I have shown, but this is a newly diagnosed individuals and the six months after the diagnosis, whether the data previously shown is overall viral suppression rates among all adolescents and young adults. And when you look at the adherence to antiretroviral therapy, which we know is highly efficient, and try to compare if there are any differences between those youth who grew up with HIV and acquired it perinatally, and those youth who acquired it horizontally, also uh, called behavioral in certain studies, 
we can see that there are some similarities and there are some differences. Overall, from the study from about 20 adolescent medicine trials that I'm showing you the data from, you can see that fairly high proportion of use is on antiretroviral therapy. But when you look at the darker blue bars, which represent viral suppression, you can see how suboptimal it is and the proportion is significantly smaller across all ages and the particular smaller when you start crossing into adolescent age. When you look and compare the barriers uh, of the viral suppression and the potential predictors of the better outcomes with HIV, you can see that among perinatally infected use, the last two bullets to the right, consistent HIV care and lack of substance abuse predicted better outcome and better rates of viral suppression, while older age, heterosexuality, employment and education were significantly related to RTUs in use with horizontally acquired HIV. Overall, we know that the young people and adolescents go through multiple transitions, and those multiple transitions listed on the left actually are quite intricately interacted and connected to multiple adherence barriers they experience. Let me just briefly walk you through multiple transition and remind ourselves what a different time it is from the reminder of our lives. This is an age where HIV status disclosure for perinatally infected use is quite important and is happening in the majority of the cases and where newly infected young people have to share frequently their sexuality and roots of infection with their caregivers at home. Multiple changes through physical development, physiological changes, and an onset of sexual life. Multiple cultural religious transformation goes through these years, as long as social integration is a grown-up independent adult multiple behavioral adaptations, and we all know of the high emotional liability during this time period that is related directly to these changes. Educational status changes, people graduate schools, universities, they undergo a significant psychological maturation and they acquire financial independence. Together, all these transitions set up the stage for multiple adherence barriers listed to the right. And among those, and not all of them, a significant reminds one of the most significant barriers is a stigma, both self-perceived and external. Disclosure of HIV status to friends, peers, and partners. Significance of peer pressure in this age is more than any other age in our lives. This is an age of onset of risk-taking behaviors and a particular interest to substance abuse, high social-emotional liability, and a lot of newly arising mental health issues. This is an age where you acquire economical independence, but yet it is quite limited. And an access to independent care, for example, independent transportation is limited as well. And after all, use is an age of multiple life priorities and truly irrelevance of long-term consequences. When we try to see which models of care work for young people, recognizing how many challenges, barriers, and transitions they undergo, we have looked at several studies, and I want to share just a few highlights with you. In particular, the study that looked at the care um, engagement linkage and engagement and in care initiative among 15 US-based clinics that shown that only 62% of adolescents were linked engaged in care. And when trying to compare different models, it's particularly high highlighted the importance of Model A, where real-time data shared with outreach workers working directly with consumers, with youth and adolescents, seem to be most efficient approach. And data sharing and effectiveness of outreach workers combined seem to really be associated with better engagement and care. And also, the study has shown that clinics serving adolescent and pediatric customers, such as ours, and those that focus on HIV only, such as ours, were usually more successful in engaging adolescents than those that were adolescents only. Overall, the analysis of pediatric and adolescents program and models of adolescent care in the United States has shown several promising practices that improve continuum of care. And I will stop on a few that are highlighted in bold uh, in, in our, my presentation, a presentation of our colleagues throughout session. Particular important that interventions and programs both could be independent and collaborative to improve outcomes that are really looking at the outcomes, community and structural level interventions to improve them, strategies to address evolving financial challenges, and evaluation of long-acting antiretroviral therapy for treatment, and risk reduction intervention. 
And finally, the two others that we will be discussing today's interventions to promote care engagement and adherence to antiretroviral medications, and particularly important for this session, integrated treatment approaches, where we try to combine psychological, medical, and ancillary services. Just in a glance, what is our clinic like? What are three of us representing today? Our clinic is fairly large for United States. There are adolescents older than 12 years of age, approximately 160 clients represent about 70% of overall pediatric and adolescent patients in care. We have approximately equal distribution of gender and the majority of our clients are perinatally infected. 30% are African immigrants, 10% international adoptees, and 10% of antiretroviral treatment either for significant non-adherence and non-acceptance of treatment or being elite controllers and having never been initiated on antiretroviral therapy and postponing that start. 40% are living with non-biological parents as a caregiver, and we have about 75% viral suppression rate among our clients. Our model of care is multidisciplinary team of HIV providers that comprised of multiple providers listed on the slide. Those include medical doctors, nurse practitioners, registered nurse, nutritionist or dietitian, adherence supporter. We have psychologists that have expertise in pediatric adolescent psychology and HIV, and finally case managers and patient navigators. We conduct weekly clinic review clinic meetings. We conduct monthly quality management meetings and biannual team retreats. We collaborate quite actively with the community partners and we are actively engaged with three regional departments of health from Maryland, Virginia and District of Columbia. And yet with all these resources, I wanted to show you the data that we have just published. It's still in print and press, I believe the paper. By the time you will be hearing this presentation, August should be out. We have looked at the one of the most efficient regimens we have now in hand, integrase inhibitor-based regimens, particularly with dolutegravir. And we compare the outcomes among those adolescents in use in our clinics, in our program, who were able to achieve viral suppression after being switched to this efficient regimens as these drugs appeared in our arsenal in the last 10 years. And what you can see is the difference between two graphs. And in general, what this graph tells us that among non-suppressed customers at baseline, those younger than 13 were significantly more likely to achieve viral suppression. And yet, in the presence of the most efficient therapy available today, the adolescent patients and adolescent customers from older than 13 years of age in the red dotted line were much less likely to become virally suppressed. As I come to the conclusion of the introduction to the session that I hope highlighted to you significant challenges and potential applicability of certain models of care for adolescents and young adults living with HIV in the United States, I'd like to finish with uh, the, my last slide of that introduction Share with you what lessons have we learned over the years, inciting the quote of one of the most admirable global leaders in my eyes, Nelson Mandela. I will start with the quote by Nelson Mandela. Do not judge me by my success. Judge me by how many times I fell down and got up again. The journey with HIV is long and it takes multiple team members to support it. You need to be prepared for multiple stop and restart, particularly as young people undergo significant transitions in their lives. Ongoing communication with the team, within the team and with customers is the key to the success. We have learned always taking time to listen and get used not to always being heard right away and then repeating our message. And we have learned that our commitment to the customer will always eventually pay off. And we also have learned that as we are learning ourselves every day to work with young people, we also need to help the caregivers and network of support that they have in the community to cope and find their own balance as everything changes along the life continuum of adolescents and young adults and their priorities and needs evolve as they grow up. With that introduction, I will share with you the slide with several references that were used in this presentation. And I'm very happy to pass the uh, presentation to a great colleague of mine and an incredibly supportive person in our program, Olivia Munger. Olivia is a registered dietitian, but she wears multiple hats in our program, including a, an enhanced adherence supporter for our use. And I will be transitioning presentation now to you, Olivia, and I will continue advancing the slides. 
Thank you. My name is Olivia Munger, and as she said, I'm the registered dietitian here at Children's National Hospital. And today I'm going to talk a little bit about our cooking classes that we hold for our youth and how we use them as a collaborative approach for our peer support group. Next slide. So we all know that nutrition is important for overall healthy lifestyle. And this is especially true for our youth living with HIV. Uh, we see our customers from ages zero to 24. So it's important for us to be cognizant of the long-term health effects of the care we provide. And because of this, nutrition plays a significant role in our care plan. Um, in addition to just being good for our overall health, we know that nutrition supports a healthy immune system and the food that our patients choose to eat also helps to support a healthy weight throughout their youth and adolescence, and that can help prevent chronic diseases down the line. We also know that the foods that we choose can help our patients uh, better absorb their antiretroviral medications. We see on both ends of the nutrition spectrum, malnutrition and obesity, there are long-term um, comorbidities for people living with HIV. They have a significant nutrition component. One of our main concerns is cardiovascular disease. We know that this is one of the um, leading causes of morbidity and mortality in people living with HIV, and it has a significant nutrition component. We know that chronic inflammation can come from the foods that you eat, and this can exacerbate atherosclerosis. Nutrition also can cause insulin resistance, which is a precursor to type 2 diabetes, which is itself then a risk factor for cardiovascular disease. <clears throat> we also tend to see dyslipidemia in our patients um, in the form of high triglycerides and elevated cholesterol, which can then accelerate the progression of cardiovascular disease. <clears throat> and all of these conditions can be at least partially controlled by a healthy diet. So it's important to us that we impart these principles to our families frequently in our clinic visits. Next slide, please. <clears throat> this slide just provides a few resources if you're interested in learning more about nutrition for your clients living with HIV. Next slide, please. Overweight and obesity are ongoing concerns in the pediatric population. We know nationwide that pediatric obesity rates are at about 18.5%. And in our population of youth living with HIV at Children's National Hospital, we found the rate to be 16.7%. And a similar pediatric cohort in Florida found their obesity rates were 12%. So even though these rates are lower than the national average, this is still a concern with us because we know that pediatric obesity tends to track into adulthood. There are a million reasons why obesity are on the rise, but we wanted to highlight some that are related to the cooking classes that we provide here at the hospital. We know that among almost all Americans, fruit and vegetable intake is inadequate. Um, and this is especially important for kids living with HIV and um, especially concerning for those from low income households. We know that the fiber from fruits and vegetables tends to increase satiety and can be protective against dyslipidemia and insulin resistance. Another contributor to the decrease in home cooking is that families are busier than ever. Um, so home cooking is declining, leading to a decrease in the parental transfer of cooking skills from parents to children. You just don't have that modeling of the behavior happening in the home. This leads a lot of families to get meals from restaurants and fast food establishments, and those men's meals tend to be higher in fat, salt, and calories. And so all of these factors put together um, lead to adolescents not having food-related skills as they grow up. We're thinking of things like label reading, meal preparation, and healthy shopping skills, and these can predict poor nutrition habits in the future. Next slide, please. So here at Children's National, we're fortunate to be able to provide a wide array of nutrition support services for our customers. Um, at almost every clinic visit, our patients are getting a comprehensive nutrition assessment as well as education and nutrition counseling. We've also piloted a high-dose vitamin D quality management project 
with the Walgreens here at our hospital. We're able to send 50,000 IU vitamin D tablets directly to our patient's home to help increase um, compliance. We also screen each of our customers for food insecurity using the Hunger Vital Signs 2 question screening. And then we provide referrals to community agencies to give them long-term food support. At each clinic visit, our customers also get a bag of fresh produce. And if they screen positive for food insecurity, they then can take home a bag of non-perishable foods in addition. We hold monthly cooking classes for our customers and their families. And then I also collaborate with our mental health and social work team to provide nutrition related content to our peer groups and parent advisory councils. Next slide. On this slide, you can see the pictures of the foods that our families are able to take home. On the left hand side, you see our fresh bag of produce. This is about eight to ten dollars of fruits and vegetables, along with a recipe in the bag to help them prepare the vegetables provided. We started this in grant year 28 and gave out 268 bags. And then in grant year 29, we gave out 422. This averages is about eight to 10 bags a week. Um, and this has been huge for our patient satisfaction. Uh, before I even walk in the room with the bag, some of our clients ask the provider what's in the bag this week. Um, so we know that the kids are really loving it. It is playing an important role in their nutrition. On the right, we have our food insecurity bags. Um, we've given out 24 of these since we started the program in grant year 29. Again, these aren't meant to be a long-term solution, but if a patient is having food insecurity, it can at least get them through a couple of days before we can connect them with something more permanent. Next slide, please. So we decided to hold cooking classes for our customers as an interactive method to provide nutrition education. And when you look at the literature, there are many positive effects of cooking classes. Um, you can see improvements in anthropometric outcomes, such as BMI and blood pressure. We can also see improvements in diet quality. <clears throat> Other positive outcomes include increases in cooking skills and knowledge, improved food safety behavior, such as knife skills, hand washing and cross contamination. We see improved behavioral intention to continue the cooking behaviors outside of class and increased perceived cooking ability. One of the most um, consistent and long lasting outcomes we see is the increased self efficacy from the hands on learning that they experience in class. And another really important outcome is the food exposure. Dietitians always tell families it's going to take at least 10 exposures to a new food before your child might accept it. But for many families, they don't have the time or the money for this. So the cooking class is an important space where kids can see, taste, and experience the new food and um, help build their palate without families having to spend their own money. Next slide, please. So when we started our cooking classes, we had a few goals in mind. The first one was to provide that safe space for exposures to new foods and even let children experiment and taste familiar foods in new ways. We also wanted to teach some basic cooking techniques. We think of these as life skills that our customers can take with them to college and beyond. We wanted to build a sense of community among youth having a similar life experience and increase their self-confidence in the kitchen and outside of the kitchen. I launched these in 2018 and we started holding one cooking class per month. During the summer months when kids are free, we'll sometimes hold additional classes. Shortly after we got started, I started partnering with Mental Health uh, to collaborate on the peer support group. For young adults, we hold two cooking classes a, a year and um, I've started popping in on their virtual visits to provide nutrition education as well. I started collaborating with the teen support group by holding an eight week summer series for teenage girls called Her Story, and it's since morphed into our Super Saturday format. All participants for the cooking class get groceries to take home to recreate the recipes from class. The picture on this slide was sent to us from a customer who recreated our orange chicken and sesame broccoli dish that we made in class. Next slide, please. Our current lesson plan allows for a one hour cooking class. Previously, when it was a standalone class, 
Um, it was two hours, but now we're just holding it immediately after a one hour peer support group. While the kids are with us, the parents are in parent advisory councils for two hours. The first five minutes of class, we review a nutrition lesson related to the recipe. We discuss ingredients and talk about the cooking technique. The kids are a little talked out after the peer support group, so you have to make it quick. They then do 40 minutes of cooking and then finish up with 15 minutes of eating and cleaning up. We're lucky to have kids that come almost every week, so we have to keep it fresh with new recipes. We've done fish tacos with a cabbage slaw, chicken tikka masala with curry cauliflower, jambalaya and cornbread. We've made homemade spaghetti noodles with fresh marinara, quesadillas, and the list goes on and on. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is a kind of a summary measure of our class attendees. And as a note, these are not unique attendees. Um, for example, in grant year 28, we had 57 total attendees over 14 classes. We had about four people per class and 33 Ryan White eligible children. In grant year 29, we had 44 total attendees over 13 classes, which is about three per class and 39 Ryan White eligible children. And so we were able to increase the number of children that came and we started sending our parents to support group. And so that's why the total number decreased. Next slide, please. Okay, these are some pictures of our cooking class in action. On the left hand side, you have one of our participants making uh, the quick cabbage slaw to go along with the fish tacos. And this class was a perfect example of how we provide that space for kids to experiment with new foods. One of our participants was comfortable handling the fish for the taco. She breaded it, cooked it in a skillet, assembled a beautiful fish taco, and had zero desire to eat it. Um, fortunately, her mother, you know, loves fish, so the food didn't go to waste, but as a parent of a picky eater, you would never spend that money on food that is going to go to waste. And on the right hand side, we were making chicken teriyaki sushi. Again, the sushi was a new flavor for the kids, um, so it's fun. They love to get in there and experiment. Next slide, please. Okay. Our current iteration is our Super Saturday. You can see the flyer on the right hand side um, where we hand this out in clinic. We have the days, times, a little bit of information about our class. We have about 10 regular attendees, 80% female, ages eight to 18 years. And so once we started partnering with the peer support group, we did limit who could come a little bit. We need for each of our participants to be disclosed to their HIV status so they can have that confidential conversation in peer support group. And so we stopped allowing um, siblings to come. We hold it once a month on Saturdays from 10 to 12. We've tried other days and times, but our families, some families do drive quite a distance. So um, the commute just isn't realistic on a weeknight. We do one hour peer support and one hour cooking class. I recommend that you do it in this order. It's sometimes hard um, to get kids focused after doing the cooking. We're fortunate enough to have a teaching kitchen on site, so we're able to have it here. And I like to set up the class so that each participant has their own station and makes their own recipe. Um, but there's a bunch of different models. Um, it doesn't have to be like exactly like ours. So, and I just wanted to emphasize how much this um, collaborative approach has affected our class. Um, our participants are widely dispersed over the DC area, so it would be hard for them to come to the hospital for each of these separate events. So by combining them, our customers are having a much more meaningful experience in one session. Next slide, please. At the end of each class, we're giving out surveys to see how we're doing. Um, we want to measure where whether our participants are feeling confident that they can prepare a recipe at home, whether or not they learn something new about cooking or nutrition at this class, they believe the rest of the lesson is relevant to them, if they learned anything about making healthier food choices, and we want to gauge their interest in coming to more classes. And across the board, our customers really give us high scores on our cooking classes. Next slide, please. And I want to quickly touch on the Parent Advisory Council that runs concurrently with our cooking classes. This class is run by Nara Lee, our social work manager. And they've held eight classes since 
2019. Nara gets a huge meal for the families each time they come, so they're well fed. They get to take home leftovers. Each group has about three to four attendees with our max class size being seven. It was originally designed as a parent advisory council to provide feedback to our program, but it really morphed into a parent support group as time went on. There's a different topic each week, including transition to adult care, disclosure, adherence support, and a lot of times the parents just want to talk about parenting a teenager. Yeah, honestly, they just want an outlet and it's great for them. Next slide, please. All right, so I want to provide some tips for anyone interested in starting their own cooking class. If you don't have a teaching kitchen at your facility, a recreation center is probably going to be your best bet. The cooking class you see in this picture was held at a recreation center. Two of the most important things in picking a site is you want a room with a sink so you can wash dishes and a room with plenty of outlets. I like to use these induction cooktops. You can see in the picture, they're not about $90 from Amazon and the heat dissipates quickly. So if someone touches, touches it, it, they're not gonna get burned. It's about $2,500 to buy all these startup materials. Any room rental is going to be on top of that. You'll probably spend about $200 for class and groceries. And then on top of that, it'll be a little bit more if you want to give your participants groceries to take home. This setup will allow for about six to eight tables. You can put one family at each table or you can pair up some teams at a table. And since we have not been able to hold our cooking classes during COVID, we've been sending care packages to keep our teams engaged. Our psychologists chose to send art supplies. Our parent advisory council members got lotion and self-care products. And then I sent our cooking class attendees a teen-focused cookbook and a $50 grocery gift card to spend on ingredients for a recipe of their choosing. And we all wrote a little note about why we sent that item to them. Next slide, please. A few additional tips. I like to provide cooking classes to children nine and above. I find at this age, they have just about enough dexterity to use a chef knife and cook on a hot plate with supervision. If you're including parents, I really like to encourage them not to do a cooking. I like to set this as a ground rule at the beginning of class and uh, provide friendly reminders throughout the class. I also recommend you have about one adult for two to three teams. So if you have the parents in the class, two to three staff members should be sufficient. If you have younger children and you want to hold a class, I recommend recipes that don't involve them doing the cooking. Um, you could do English muffin pizzas or have them mix together muffins. And while you bake the food, they engage in a nutrition lesson. And I always encourage people to test recipes ahead of time. There are a lot of poorly written recipes on the internet and you don't want it to flop in class. And always keep the environment light and allow kids to mess up and have fun as part of the learning feedback system. And remind them that not every deep meal is gonna come out looking like it belongs on Instagram, but it can still be tasty and that's okay. Always keep a first aid kit on hand I've never had any major mishaps, but every now and again, it, someone will cut their finger. Another ground rule I'd like to set ahead of time so teens know what's coming is that they have to clean up after themselves. A major reason I hear from parents that teens aren't allowed to cook at home is because they make a mess and they never clean it up. So it's our job to impart that that is part of the cooking process. And as always, include an evaluation survey and ask your teens what they want to be learning. And then one last tip is that if you are inviting the whole family, um, ask which siblings are going to come. If you have a parent bringing a teen and a young child, their attention is going to be divided and they're not going to be watching the teen as closely as they should. So ask them to bring another adult or have them leave the younger child at home. So that's a little bit about what we're doing for our cooking classes and some tips to start your own. Um, I'm happy to share any recipes or startup materials with you, and I look forward to taking your, uh, your questions later. Thank you. Thank you, Olivia. This is Natalia Rachmanian. and I'm taking over and just sharing last slide with references used to introduction of the significance of the health and nutrition that Olivia highlighted in the beginning 
of her presentation. Um, I will be taking over back now and talking about our support of the clinic attendance. And I'm hoping by now we're able to build up a, our vision of adolescent HIV care and adolescent and young adult HIV care as a holistic approach. We want our, our customers to know that they're cared for. We want them to know that the whole life uh, continuum matters to us, the whole life environment, and they matter to us as a person. And we started looking at the option of the Uber as a one innovative solution to improve youth, reten youth retention and care and support services. I think at the same time as HERS has started investigating and supporting use of the right share for the attendance of the appointments. Well, to start with, I believe I already mentioned that the transportation is one of the significant barriers to care in young adults and adolescents uh, being independent transportation. But even when having access to independent transportation, in adult studies, we know that the transportation barriers can negatively affect healthcare access in general and not just specific to HIV. And among the barriers are long wait times for the public transportation and accessibility of vehicle transportation and cost associated with that. Among subspecific for adolescents and young adult barriers are related to transportation. Some have been studied and published. And I'm here citing the quote from two sides. One of them identifying a barrier that uh, talks about youth who have no jobs. Uh, they cannot even buy a bus pass. Well, if you need a bus pass, you need to be mailed to you. So you have to get in contact with your case manager at least two weeks prior to your appointment. That is highly unlikely behavior for any team uh, around us and in our care. Quite organized skills to manage your life. And then solution, one of the proposed solutions, I think the biggest thing is the taxi, being able to taxi a kid from 40 miles away to get to a doctor's appointment just to make sure that he gets there. We looked at some data and I'm sharing with you some also published data on the potential costs associated and early results show that ride share services actually may decrease average wait time and average ride cost. About $2.7 billion is spent on non-emergency medical transportation annually, but the study by Powers reports that wait time are long, sometimes as long as 60 minutes and drivers frequently will not show. And finally, ride share program like Lyft and Uber started launching concierge and uh, partner with health organization services in 2016 and 2018. I'm happy to share our partnership with Uber is so strong at Children's. We were happy to see their support during recent weeks of uh, COVID epidemic ramping up high in our regions and then providing a free ride to the hospital for healthcare workers and uh, use this opportunity to express our gratitude. Average wait time has decreased by 30% when using ride share in this published study, and average per ride costs actually have been reduced by almost a third. Study with refugee women demonstrated the lower non-show rates in women using ride share versus women who use down transportation to attend clinic in a study that just been published from Boston Medical Center Refugee Women's Health Clinic. And it's a very recent data. And this is specifically looking at women's gynecological visits and reporting transportation difficulties. And you can see 31 out of 102 uh, women reported transportation security received rights and were able to attend care. And yet some are questioning whether this is working, what will be actual uptake? University of Pennsylvania health care system showed no difference in attendance at primary care with right share services. But please notice this is a prime care services. Mean age was 46 years. This is usually the age where people have access to some form of transportation or experience dealing with the transportation issues. Data are lacking on the impact of right share on the subspecialty HIV clinic care attendance and particularly among youth. And to date, no data are published to see whether uh, using right share services actually can affect customer health outcome. So we launched in 2018 an Uber Health account. Uh, we launched our program at Ryan White Services already using existing Uber Health account from Children's Hospital. Sorrow review of customer needs is conducted prior to the decision when and how to offer ride share. We look at all the criteria realizing Ryan White is a pay of rest resort. We look at Ryan White eligibility, distance to residence, work, school. We look at the availability of transportation, including for previous visits, facilitators and barriers to care. 
Initially, it was launched to support just medical appointments, but we quickly came to realize that there are additional transportation needs among our, our customers. Those particularly include mental health appointments and attendance of the peer support groups frequently conducted after hours and the cooking classes uh, the, or combined events that combine cooking classes and peer support groups that Olivia just uh, uh, discussed and described to you. So Uber rides scheduled every Friday on the following week for a following week appointments. Case manager in our model must evaluate any other transportation options for customer family prior to utilizing Uber Health. If we decide that the uh, jointly through the meetings and thorough review that ride share is eligible and the client is eligible for ride share, case manager gathers the following information. We connect customer name, appointment date and time, address for pickup, cell phone numbers, including email address of customer and or guardian, pick up time according to the Google Maps estimate. This does give clients the flexibility to be picked up at any location that suits their schedule on the day of the appointment. Reminder call made to customer on the day of ride share services is always made and then we do have initial text message received by customer when the ride is scheduled and a second test, a text on the day of the ride indicating driver's name, car type, color, and license plate. And all this information is available to us through our access to the Uber Health uh, corporate account. Customer is asked to check with the driver prior to entering the car. We place big emphasis on safety training of our use. And customer is asked to contact case manager if they require any immediate assistance or have any problem during the ride. What was important for us as we launched this program is because of the paucity of the data that we really started a very proactively and build the elaborate uh, database that we maintain and use to analyze the usage of the right share. What you can see on this is an example of our data tracking sheet. You can see the personal identifiers are removed, but you can see which location, which state, you can see pickup time, you can see what type of the appointment, we document the cost of the ride, fare, and then total cost. You can see several of them are listed here in any additional comments. Well, how did we do? We just wanted to share with you the pilot data on the uptake. The uptake has been great. We actually have a great interest, and I must tell you in terms of funding, it's quickly um, running out because the uptake has been going up. And you can see if you try to determine some seasonality, which are, we are looking at, we were trying to think whether winter months will be more, but it seems to be quite well distributed throughout the year. Definitely some spike around winter months. Uh, right share use by type of visits. When you look at this, as I said, we designed it by starting just for medical visits, but quickly evolved. And now medical visits constitute only about one third of our Uber uh, right share use. And 24% is used for lab visits when we need to repeat laboratory tests to obtain laboratory tests in our clients. 25% for mental health. And 20% actually is used to attend peer support. We looked at the evaluation of the program from the point of view of age and satisfaction. We actually have launched a formal survey and study and the anonymous voluntary surveys were administered using the Likert scale or Likert or using right share in the future by our, among our clients and the level of satisfaction. We collected demographic data and used descriptive statistics and we're sharing with you now some of the pilot data from an ongoing evaluation and ongoing analysis. And this data a particular is through Octo from October to 18 to December to 19. You can see that the majority of the users of the ride share program were aged 18 to 24. We have a very small proportion under age 13. And then 13 to 18 years is the second largest category of that using the ride share program. When we looked at the results of the survey, we looked at the gender distribution and very reflectant of our clinic. To the right, you see the gender of our customers. That's approximately half and half as our population. But when you looked at the caregivers who uh, used right share along with the clients, you can see the majority of them are females. We looked at 50 adolescent young adults with a median age of 19 years. And we have also looked at the 42.8% of caregivers used right share multiple times in the previous 12 months. And I'm sharing with you a quote of one of the caregivers 
here, which I will read. Uber Lyft is very helpful to me. I often have to leave work from one part of town to get my teens. That's in another part of town, which takes about an hour. Then we have to drive to clinic, which can take more time. When an Uber Lyft can pick up my teen, that's very helpful. And it is shared by the caregiver who was actually able to come and meet the client at the appointment directly, not making this additional loop of bringing him uh, to the, or her to the appointment. We looked at the ride share user opinions and we asked them whether they believed as a ride share was able to reduce burden and cost of transportation. And you can see 100% of caregivers believed it was the case. Very a high rate of uh, both caregiver and customers interested in using ride share again, close to 100 by the users and 100% uh, among the caregivers. It equally high rates of feeling less stressed attending appointments among our use customers. We also look at the right share customer satisfaction with overall experience of using it. The 91% were highly satisfied and strongly agreed that it was easy 65%. And finally, 78% strongly agreed it allowed them to attend appointments. What we also did in our program, we wanted to gauge the interest of those who have never used Rideshare program before to see whether they would be interested in using it. And we surveyed 52 non-users of Rideshare uh, customers within our program. We wanted to know whether they used Uber or Lyft before, and you can see 70% said yes. We wanted to ask them whether they used specifically Rideshare prog programs that they paid out of the pocket directly themselves to get to children's and 20% of them have used it to get to the medical appointments and approximately the same number have used to get them for any other health facilities. But when we ask them whether they would be interested in using Uber health services through our access and our management plan and with our support, you can see the numbers have been uh, were equally high and very comparable to 70% uh, used Uber Lyft services before. And finally, some of the qualitative comments that were heard from our clients, those included um, young uh, person comment, uh, my mom drives me, but as an adult, I might say yes to Uber, and it would be easy to get to my appointments, and caregiver comments, put in place for all, a lot of people would benefit, providing Uber reduces burden of parking. So as a conclusion, we shared with you some early results of our rideshare program usage, uptake, and satisfaction among the clients, along with an intent and interest to use rideshare programs by those who have never used it. Overall, we feel that uh, our clients and the caregivers are highly satisfied with experience and are likely to use it again in the future. For us, it seems to be quite helpful to support a wider range of the needs, and not just medical appointments, but the ability to perform the labs, to attend mental health appointment, peer support group, and either psychosocial intervention. We wanted to share with you some of the established standard operating procedures, which I think are very important because they set the rules and make it very clear both for uh, the staff of the program, those involved in managing, but also for the customers and the caregivers, how to communicate, what to expect, and how to deal with that. And we wanted to make sure that monitoring and evaluation is ongoing and is, is very important to really measure the success. And finally, an ongoing study is underway to evaluate the cost effectiveness and impact of the right share program on treatment outcomes among adolescents and youth living with HIV in our program. And we are in process of looking whether it's truly cost, as a cost effective as some of the studies I have shared with you in the beginning. Let me finish uh, by providing the summary of the references used in this presentation as I pass the word to my colleague, Nara Lee, who is a, a case manager herself, but also a manager of our case manager team, who is going to talk to you about uh, the transition to adult care from the pediatric and adolescent healthcare settings for adolescents and youth living with HIV. Nara, to you. Thank you so much uh, for the introduction. Um, again, my name is Nara Lee. I'm a social work manager for the Special Immunology Services here at D uh, DC Children's National Hospital. Uh, today I'm going to share with you and present uh, the importance and the unique barriers that come along with transitioning HIV-infected youth to the adult world 
and how our clinic has developed a customer service um, and customer centered uh, transition program. Transitional care involves the engagement of multiple supporters, including adolescents and young adults, their treatment supporters, various providers, partners, and peers. Transition process, while observing general principle, is highly individual and needs to be tailored to the unique needs of the customer. Barriers to transition exist on multiple levels, from facility and structural barriers to individual barriers. The goal of a successful transition is to sustain and improve clinical care and related outcomes and the well-being of adolescents and young adults living with HIV. Next slide. Transition of care is challenging and a vulnerable time for our HIV-infected youth. According to the research, only 50% of youth living with HIV who transitioned successfully to adult care were retained after one year. Our youth also frequently have worse outcomes of HIV disease compared to the customers in the adult setting. In the US alone, we have around 25,000 HIV infected youth that are scheduled to transition to the adult world in the next decade. The chart on your right shows a descriptive statistic of both adolescent and adult clinics among 14 participating clinics in the adolescent trials network. Some of the uh, differences that you can see in the chart are um, overall more female staff, uh, nurse practitioners and social workers at the, adult, uh, at the adolescent clinic compared to the adult clinics, which can be a barrier to a successful transition of care. Next slide. According to the research done by Servia, these are the major transition buckets of barriers. Customers are accustomed to pediatric facility multidisciplinary team. Uh, they build a bond with the staff and facility uh, throughout the years. Uh, disclosure and retelling their stories can be traumatizing and painful. Uh, they may have a history of trauma, mental health illness, and or substance abuse. Last but not least, there's a stigma of the internal and external um, in the new setting. Next slide. We started a pilot transition program back in 2011 and has gone through many updates and tweaks with the collaborative efforts between our clinical team and our customers. This is a customer testimonial that shows what it was like for them uh, navigating into the adult world back in 2006. TM is a 20 year old perinatally infected female and she stated, my transition to adult care was not an easy one, and I had to do a lot of research to find a good doctors who offered evening hours and accepted new customers. Although the internet was around, it was not as easy to use for research and finding out information back in 2006 as it is now. It would have been helpful if I were provided with a list of doctors and centers at least six months prior to me aging out of the children's hospital care. I ended up switching providers two times before I found Mary Santa, which I have been at for five years. Uh, TM is currently now a 34 year old in a disclosed relationship and currently finishing up school for early childhood development. Next slide. Uh, now I will be sharing with you two different case examples to show the complex and diverse needs of our customers. Uh, Kyle is a 23 year old MSM male who was uh, horizontally infected at the age of 18. He did not engage in care until six months after diagnosis. He's the main caregiver for his mother, works as a night security guard. Uh, he's been coping with the stigma, trauma, and depression with heavy drinking, which has um, affected his multiple admissions to uh, the hospital for pancreatitis and other health-related issues. Uh, he's had multiple changes to our ART regimens due to not adherence. And his uh, latest CD4 count is at 16 cells. HIV viral load was at 360,000 copies. And he will be needing to uh, transition before he is 24 years old. Next slide. Uh, Mindy is a 23-year-old heterosexual female perinatally infected. She's been an elite controller since birth and has never been on ARTs. Uh, she's even had difficulties even taking daily vitamins. She believes in alternative medicine. She's recently filed a court case for sexual assault. 
Uh, she does have a great uh, family support with her older sister, currently works as an admin at a healthcare clinic, and her CD4 count is currently 528 cells. HIV viral load was 4,240 copies. Next slide. There are multiple components to our transition program. One being uh, tra pre-transitioning counseling, then intake, planning, implementation and coordination, monitoring and evaluation, and finally, graduation and closure. First is our milestones program, which we recently added to gauge the transition readiness of our customers. This was the brainchild of one of our case managers, Caitlin Wylander. Next slide. The main goal of this project is to ensure that customers are self-sufficient and confident in managing their own health care and improving adherence by the time that they are ready to transition to adult care. Our target population was Ryan White eligible uh, customers from the ages of 12 to 24, disclose about their HIV status and no cognitive delays. We did a pilot trial from May to June 2019. Next slide. Transition is not unique to HIV. There's also diabetes, sickle cell disease, and other healthcare conditions uh, that face transition care needs. Our transition readiness assessment questionnaire, AKA TRAC, is the tool we use to calculate and identify gaps in transition knowledge in our customers. And it is also validated and customer centered. We modify the questions to accommodate the needs of our HIV infected youth such as assessing the youth's ability to make appointments, to understand medications, and developing other skills needed to transition to adult care. The picture on your right shows our track form that we adapted from the Eastern Tennessee State University Transition Assessment Tool. Next slide. The Milestones program was designed considering the biopsychosocial assessment conducted by the case managers on a periodic basis so the customers do not feel like they're being categorized. It starts off with each case manager completing a baseline for their customers. Uh, a new track form is completed on a yearly basis to track the progress of each customer. Gaps noted in the customer's track form will influence the type of education needed in the upcoming year. Case managers share this information with the multidisciplinary team during the medical rounds. Additional to uh, all that they do, they will be writing clinical progress notes with many narratives that will indicate uh, any halts and delays in the customer's progress, such as death in the family, bullying issues, or a new relationship. Next slide. There are four different milestones categories. Uh, as you can see on the um, picture on the left, uh, in the yellow is the HIV Education Managing Medication 101. Uh, in the green is Health Management Level 1. In the purple is Health Management Level 2. And uh, in orange is Pre-Transition um, Category. Some examples of uh, the questions are, uh, do you know the names of your medication? Do you know what a CD4 viral load is? Do you know the name and location of your pharmacy? And do you know how to refill them? And uh, lastly, do you even know what your um, insurance is? Do you carry it with you? And do you know how to renew your insurance? The results from the customer's individual track form are collected on a spreadsheet that calculates the overall track score. We developed a uh, score range according to each age group to identify if a customer was on track or off track that was developmentally appropriate. We got a baseline for all of our customers and we found out that about half of our customers were on track to be transitioning ready. Next slide. The chart on your left uh, are the baseline results according to their age categories. As you can see, uh, we would like to increase the percentage of customers in each age bracket to be transition ready, which is in blue, especially uh, for those who are older since they will be transitioning to adult provider by the age of 24. Our goal is to have 70% of our customers on track by the age of 19 through 2020. Uh, scores, recorded, uh, scores will be recorded in the case manager files Transition readiness uh, will be included in the multidisciplinary team reviews 
Uh, we'll be utilizing additional uh, platforms for customer education. Uh, we'll be integrating the milestones assessment in the mental health interventions and peer support groups. And we're currently working on designing emails and texting tips on self-management and transition readiness. Next slide. Um, a collaborative conversation between uh, the case manager and customer is done at the pre-transition counseling. And this is done when the, uh, the customer turns 18. And it is protocol for us to have them assign an ROI when they turn 18. And a lot of questions are prompted about adult care. We start asking them, do you, uh, what is your understanding of transitioning? Uh, what are your feelings towards it? Who do you want to be involved in your transition? And we start talking to them about the transition process and the need to transition by the age of 24. Next slide. During the transition intake, the case manager and the customer review tr the transition binder and options that closely match the customer's wants and needs. Uh, we discuss the pros and cons of each facility. On the right, you see uh, the example of the wants and needs form that we actually do with our customers. And this is a great teaching moment for our customers because this is when they start realizing that now they're not gonna be able to get all of their wants and needs as possible but they have to decide what's actually really important to them. We review the customer's expectations and how adult facilities function similarly and differently. And we also consider all the stakeholders, customers, the customer's support system, pediatric and adult clinics, and the insurance companies. Next slide. The trans uh, we have a transition packet that is faxed over to the adult clinic one week prior to the customer's first adult appointment so that the adult provider has enough time to review the comprehensive medical record. This is all part of our warm handoff. Uh, the transition packet uh, consists of customer's ID insurance, lab results, clinical notes, their immunization records, the last biopsychosocial, all of the resistance panels that we have on hand, uh, mental health summary if applicable, and a release, a signed release of information. And on the right, you can see three different examples of our forms, mental health summary, release of information, and biopsychosis uh, assessment. Next slide. The customer packet is given to each customer at the beginning of the transition process. Uh, we have everything from wants and needs form that I talked about earlier, taking charge of your healthcare, tips for transitioning, a farewell letter, and a, an appointment tool. Uh, for the keys and tips for transition, um, there's such things as advice about arriving early, calling and confirming uh, your appointment, rescheduling your appointments. Uh, for the farewell lanta, uh, it's given to our customers to show our appreciation for letting us take care of them and being a part of our clinic. We want our customers to know that they may be feeling a mix of emotions when thinking about leaving the pediatric setting but it is also a momentous occasion to be transitioned to the adult care and that we are very proud of them. Uh, lastly, the last two um, uh, pictures on the right is taking care of your healthcare and also an appointment tool, which uh, the customer could put the date and time of their appointment, the provider name, and questions to ask their new provider and information that they should be taking away from their adult provider appointment. Next slide. Implementation and coordination. We currently have 12 referring centers to date, eight in DC, one in Virginia, three in Maryland. Uh, we had our customer care navigator visit each of these facilities, taking photos of what it looks like from the outside and the inside. Uh, we have a map of the location and a one pager sheet in the transition binder. Um, on the right is an example of our one pagers. It has, um, address, um, uh, modes of uh, transportation to get there, the services they provide, what to expect when they check in. Uh, all our case managers are familiar with all these facilities. We also have a memorandum of understanding developed with all of these facilities. We have appointed contact for referrals and all information is updated yearly or as needed. Next slide. After a customer has transitioned to adult care, case managers keep track of their uh, follow-up appointments on a periodic table, a uh, periodic basis. 
Next slide. We also track uh, the current medication at the last appointment and new medication changes at the adult facility. Uh, pregnancies, hospitalizations, or any other uh, new diagnosis of comorbidity. Next slide. Lastly, we also track the last CD4 and viral load, uh, the CD4 viral load at six months and at the one year mark since transitioning. Next slide. This is a recent testimonial from a customer who has been a lead controller since birth. MS is a 24 year old perinatally infected female. And she states, the staff here have been like family to me for as long as I can remember. It was definitely a little emotional for me when I outgrew children's last year. Those staff members who were closest with me made an extreme impact on my life. I wouldn't change it if I had the option, but when I had to transition, staff made, it, made sure that I was comfortable and the location to my new clinic was close to me for commute reasons. The first time I had my appointment, my case manager was right by my side like they had always been. The new adult clinic Seemed good and the staff that I had met are extremely helpful and friendly. They work with your schedule and make sure that you have a clear understanding in everything they do for you before proceeding. I like it there and I would recommend it to other customers. I'm more than grateful for the staff at Children's because they, seem, they sincerely support their customers and treat them like family. MS is now working as an admin at a dental office, debating on family planning, uh, finally starting on ARV medications and prep for her current partner. Next slide. Graduation and closure will occur after the case manager has followed the transition of customer for 12 months after the last pediatric appointment. Call the customer and provider every three months to check on their progress, collect data, assist with any troubleshooting, um, and write transition progress notes for each adult visit. There are three components that drive a successful transition. One, we have received at least two labs from the adult clinic following transition. The customers have fully engaged and imprinted with the adult provider. And finally, the customer calls the adult provider for information and support instead of the pediatric clinic. After the customer's one-year mark of adult engagement, they will be given uh, one last phone call or a letter congratulating them and will be officially closed out. Next slide. Uh, these are the updates from our two diverse customers I had mentioned earlier that are in the transition process. Kyle, the 23-year-old uh, identified MSM. Uh, he was unfortunately uh, hospitalized again for pancreatitis. He had his last tele, uh, he's going to have his last telehealth appointment at the end of this month before turning 24. He's already selected an adult provider, and the case manager will assist him and attend the first appointment. Mindy, the 24-year-old uh, self-identified uh, heterosexual female, she has selected and already attended her first appointment with her adult provider. Transition packet was faxed over prior to the appointment. Lab work was completed, and she's already made her follow-up appointment, and she's ready to uh, discuss family planning, starting meds, and prep for her partner. Uh, and Mindy is also a leak controller. Next slide. These are the references to the research articles uh, mentioned in this presentation. And on the right um, is a picture of, our, of the global toolkit for adolescent and youth transition of care that was developed by the Elizabeth Glazier Pediatric AIDS Foundation. Our uh, clinic contributed to the development of this toolkit and we are also featured in it too. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Nara. And as I conclude this session, I just wanted to recap that we had an opportunity to speak to you today about the challenges and transition faced by adolescents and youth living with HIV. We shared with you some of the uh, descriptions of our model of care, and in particular, shared with you three innovations. One is the innovation of using the holistic approach to the person's health dietitian and using the cooking classes and other nutritional intervention as the basis for our 
adherence support, and overall support of our clients, uh, combining it with psychosocial support, mental health support, and other forms of interaction, and trying to build a stronger community uh, for our clients and customers in care. Second, we shared with you the pilot results for using the right share to increase uh, the retention and care, patient satisfaction, and ease the attendance of the appointments for adolescents and youth and their related caregivers with a wide array of services that supported appointments to medical care, laboratory access, medical health appointments, and very importantly, peer support attendance. And finally, through the presentation that you just heard, um, and I'd like to express my deep gratitude both to Olivia and Nara uh, for walking us through that. You heard about our formal transition program. No question we used to transition our patients in the past as well as do many practices, but we have really listened to our clients as you could hear from the testimonies and have formalized and brought some new innovations such as a milestone program uh, and package of transition that we have implemented and as a result, uh, have seen a high level of satisfaction, better coordinated transition um, in care than previously. All these interventions in summary, uh, some other attempts of us to try to really understand and develop the best approaches to support adolescents and youth living with HIV in the United States to engage in care, stay retained in care, stay on treatment, and achieve sustained virological suppression. Our ultimate goal is that they have full lives, healthy lives, that they have a bright and long future, that their partners in the community do not transmit HIV. Uh, we are, will be very happy to answer any questions on the slide in front of me right now and in front of your cam uh, screens. You see all of our contact informations. We are very open to any follow-up chat questions following our presentations during the session, but also if anybody wants to contact us emails, these are all three email addresses. We are happy to share any of our tools, SOPs, and other documents related to our presentation with you. Thank you for listening.